back to Deadwood Tobacco Company Blowing Smoke Podcast. I am I Candy Randy, while Bill's over in the corner doing inappropriate things. Beautiful. Joining me today for this special edition is Miguel Shodel from Crowned Heads. Welcome, Miguel. Thank you for having me on the show, man. And a very special guest, Mr. Paul Rechtenwald. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. You a little nervous? Uh, absolutely. All right. Well, at least you're, at least you're honest about it. I like it. Paul is uh, um, Wild Bill's brother and is a big fan of the Deadwood Tobacco Company and our brands and is visiting. So we thought we would take the opportunity today, since we have an expert with us and a novice, we are going to do the novice and the topus. There you go. Did I say it right, Miguel? You said it very good, sir. All right. So we're going to learn today about generally beginning cigar smokers. Miguel's going to walk us through all of the aspects of everything from choosing your cigar, which can take a very long time, lighting it, preparing it, smoking it, how it changes over the first third, second third, and the third third, and all the other things that a novice smoker needs to know to help uh, enjoy the lifestyle more. So, Miguel, let's see what we've got to smoke today. Well, today I brought our Mil Diaz Topes. Uh, Mil Diaz is a blend that we do. It means a thousand days. And this is a cigar that's very popular uh, among the Crown Head cigar fans. It's our number one selling line. Uh, we make this cigar in anything from a 46 to a 56 ring gauge. So you have a lot of different choices in the Vitolas. We've done several limited editions, um, limited edition Vitolas, as well as a, a change in wrapper that we've done, which we call Maranitos. So this blend has a lot of different versions of it. But today we're going to be smoking the core size, core line, a brand new Vitola we just added. I was in Canada a couple years ago, and someone had handed me the Trinidad Topez, the Cuban Trinidad Topez, and I'm not a 56 ring gauge guy. I like thinner, 46, 48 ring gauge, but I really enjoyed the experience of that cigar, and when I came back, I talked to John Huber, um, who's one of the owners of Crown Heads, and I talked to John about it, and John was already thinking about doing a line extension of Mil Diaz, and um, you know, I told him about the, the Topes. I brought him one. He smoked it. He loved it. We tried it out. Obviously, you want to make some samples first, make sure the blend translates well. Sure. It did very well. This is a blend that translates very well from either a 46 to a 56 ring gauge. Mm -hmm. um, probably not a 60, probably not a 40 ring gauge, but in between those two, they work out really well. So what is the Topes? The Topes is a size that is four and seven eighths okay. length, mm -hmm. 56 ring gauge with a pigtail. Oh, very nice. So... I will hand one out to each of you gentlemen there here. You are. So uh, let's start with the first question. Paul, do you know what the ring gauge means? It's the diameter of the stick. There you go. See, you're not as a, you're not as much of a novice as I was led to believe. Very well, good. And, just wait. Just and wait. If it's an inch across, it would be 64 ring gauge. So well, this is a 56. Three quarters. Now you're getting into math there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no one, hey, when I got invited, us, no one said there'd be math. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no math at all. No, no. Um, but no, so if, if it's based on an inch. Okay. And the inch is six, would be a 64 ring gauge, right? So a 56 of 64 of an inch uh, is how you, how you measure that ring gauge. Um, so this is, this is a hefty ring gauge. In today's cigar smoking, you know, 56 mm -hmm. is still considered very, very thick and heavy. Um, the pigtail is a signature of that particular Vitola or size. And it's just a just a beautiful beautiful cigar. I think when you're when you're choosing a cigar nowadays, almost everything comes in cellophane. Sure. Um, I would say probably ninety percent of premium cigars now come in cellophane. And some of the just simple things is that you know if you are feeling a cigar in the humidor, um, if you want to feel you know the the kind of the, the 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 softness of the cigar, you want to do it at the foot. On this cigar, there's a foot band, but you want to squeeze at the foot if you want to feel that kind of uh, uh, give how you know does it have good humidity in it you never squeeze up near the head because obviously we have glue up there that holds the cap on um, and you don't want to do it in the middle because you could crack the wrapper but if you feel towards the end you should be able to squeeze it very gently and feel the the, the humidity of the cigar right Got it. and uh, picking out a cigar I think is very subjective right if you have um, a half an hour to smoke, don't pick a long or very thick cigar. Those are very simple kind of things that some people will go, oh man, why did I light this up? I don't have enough time. Well, that's why we make so many different Vitolas. Um, and the Vitola is very important. I think when you're looking at cigars, the Vitolas, if you look at uh, the early 1900s to the 20s to the 40s to the 50s, Vitola shapes of cigars have tremendously changed. Um, when you look at the late 1800s, early 1900s, everything was shaped like the old cartoon cigars, sure. right? Mm -hmm. It was uh, shaped like a like a 
bulbous kind of. Yeah, yeah. kind of bulbous, kind of perfecto, right? Um, those were in vogue at that time, you know. Um, this is a round cigar, which most people don't know, but the proper name for a round cigar is Parejo. Parejo. Parejo means straight-sided cigar. So Parejo is really anything that is round is a Parejo. And then you have Figurado, which is a general term, which includes Torpedoes, Bellicosos, Diademas, all those kind of funky-shaped cigars. Mm -hmm. And, and a kind of a sub is of the of the Parejo would be a box press or a trunk press cigar. The real name is trunk press, but in the industry we refer to it as box sure. press. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that, either the length, the ring gauge, or the shape, is something that is so subjective. I am I love smoking different vitolas because each vitola tends to affect the taste of the cigar, right? Absolutely. And so. Some blends are great in a, in a thin ring gauge. Some are great in a big ring gauge. Some don't taste good in different sizes. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's to me, that's part of the fun of cigar smoking, right? If you find a blend you love, smoke it in many different Vitolas and see which one really hits you. You know, I've met guys who go, man, I love Mil Diaz. My favorite is the Corona Gorda. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't smoke the Edmundo. And I'll meet someone else who said, man, the Edmundo is the best one. And that's kind of the fun, I think, you know? And those slight changes in flavor are due to the ratio of wrapper to filler binder. 100%. You hit the nail on the head. Wrapper to filler ratio. Mm -hmm. Also, length. So when you're heating that tobacco up, the longer the cigar, the cooler the smoke gets towards the end. If it's a short cigar and it's a big ring gauge, well, obviously it's going to burn a lot hotter and warmer. So all of that plays into effect. Um, as far as choosing a blend goes, a blend is, man, it's so tough these days because... You know, back in the day, you could say, I love Nicaraguan or I love Dominican. But today, there's so many blends, almost like blended scotches, I exactly. guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost hard to find a Puro anymore. And when we say Puro mm -hmm. in the industry, it means filler, binder, wrapper, rolled, all in the same country. So you don't see that as often as you used to. Um, so like this cigar here, the Mil Diaz, you're talking about an Ecuador Habano wrapper, Nicaraguan binder. The tobaccos inside are where it really gets unique. So we have Nicaraguan tobacco from Esteli and Jalapa. Those are two regions in Nicaragua. Esteli has a very black clay uh, soil, very, produces a much fuller body tobacco. Jalapa has a very brown sandy clay soil that has a lot of flavor nuance to it. And then in here, we have a special tobacco called Pero de Oro. Pero de Oro means golden hairs. It's a little tobacco plant, doesn't grow very large, so it doesn't have a lot of yield. Um, most people do not grow it. There are people that are growing it in Nicaragua and Peru and other places like that. It's a very short plant, but it's known for having this incredible flavor, almost burnt caramely sweetness on the palate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really nice. And as I said, it has low yield. So it's not a, a, a tobacco that's used heavily in our industry. Sure. And um, Pero de Oro, like I said, could be grown in several different places. This contains Pero de Oro from Peru. And so this has a, a beautiful, healthy dose of Pero de Oro. Now, the problem with this cigar could be the Nicaraguan tobaccos could overpower the Pero de Oro. So the solution is much like how a uh, sommelier would pair food with a meal, right? Mm -hmm. Salty, sweet, bitter. You're, miss, you're, you're, you're trying to play with all these different flavors. So we found by adding a, a, a leaf of Costa Rican, this particular Costa Rican leaf we have is ha very salty. Okay. And what does salt do? Makes you salivate. Mm -hmm. And when you salivate, you can taste more. So by salivating a little bit heavier, you're able to pick up the Pero de Oro notes along with mm -hmm. the Nicaraguan tobaccos. So very complex, medium strength and medium bodied. And I'll, I'll, body and strength gets thrown around a lot in this business, right? I always say strength is kind of the nicotine. That's what gives you that kind of wooziness on a strong cigar. Body is really the heaviness or the chewiness, the thickness of the smoke. You could have a full-bodied cigar that's medium in strength. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, I've had mild strength cigars that have a good body to them, mm -hmm. a medium bodied. So body and strength are completely two different things. How are we doing there at the end? Yeah, we're, we're doing for, excellent. Ready for the quiz? Nope. <laughs> All right. I'm ready so, for a cutter, though. <laughs> ready for a cutter. He's like, he's yeah. like, he's like yeah. shut up. Let's smoke this. Let's, <laughs> let's smoke this. So look, this cigar has a pigtail, yep. right? Um, you could twist and pull that out and get a, get a draw, right? But uh, we're not savages. <laughs> I have a guillotine. Now, everyone has their preference, right? You have guillotine, you have V-cut, you have hole punch. There's a lot of different ways. 
to me, the guillotine has been around the longest because back in those days when they had the perfectos, there were no hole punch. There was no V-cut. Right. So to me, tradition is a guillotine, either a double or single guillotine. I have passed that down to you. Now, I will hold something to the camera here. Um, that is the cap. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. That is the cap. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people when you're cutting a cigar, think of it as scalping somebody and not beheading them. Ah, very good. Mm. Here's, you know? a, here's, a little, here's a little tobacco etiquette. Don't ever lick your cigar and then ask somebody to use their cutter. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Um, it's not the proper thing to do. So, now we're going to remove the foot band. Whoops. Not, not every cigar... Oh, you already did it. Not every cigar has a foot band, but at Crown Heads, we don't typically put our name on the band. So, we put a foot band just to let you know that these cigars are made um, by Crown Heads. This cigar is produced at a little factory in Nicaragua. Um, and Irradio Pichardo is the master blender there, and he does a great job for us. Also does our Juarez and, and our Mildias for us. And uh, he did a great job on this cigar. Uh, so we're going to light. Um, I see people light all different ways. And I'll be honest with you. It's one of the things that drives me craziest in this industry. When I see people singe the wrapper, singe it. And the best way to avoid that, obviously, um, is to toast it. And the part you cut off, the cap, is called the head of the cigar. The part you light is called the foot of the cigar. So we will be torching the foot now. Sabotage me with this Dupont. Oh, man. <laughs> the Dupont. You, 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 you give him the $1,000 lighter and it doesn't work. Oh, hey, man. Hey, hey, there you go. So if you, if you properly roast or toast the foot of your cigar, you won't have to hold the flame to it very long when you go to puff on it, right? So here we go. Mm. Now look. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I literally held this to my cigar when I puffed for a matter of seconds. And that's probably the only millionth cigar you've smoked, right? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> the worst thing you want to do is overheat the tobacco. You really want to warm that foot of that cigar. You really want to make sure. Right, We're struggling here at the bottom. At the having us getting sabotaged. All right, we'll try that. We'll try that. Oh, there it is. There's a nice. Now, sometimes when you light, sometimes you'll need to rotate your cigar while you light it. Um, I do always recommend to blow on the foot. Make sure you have a nice even burn. And um, what, you're, what you're essentially doing now is you're lighting the tobacco, which is going to create some heat, which will in turn cause the tobacco to um, release its oils. And that's really what we're enjoying, right? We don't inhale cigars. Why? Because we don't have taste buds in our lungs. It's about taste. It's about flavor. It's about aroma. And we're really working on getting the tobacco nice and warmed and primed for a really nice, enjoyable smoke. And what you're doing with this cigar is, as you smoke now it's it, not working for me. Oh, I need a little bit over goodness. here. There, we're struggling here. There we go. I wonder why they put me over here. <laughs> now I've seen all the different types of things where you know people talk about how many puffs you should take every minute or people, whatever. People turn I think that's twisted, silly. Twisted. It's really about. It. There you go. It's you really about on. finding what's comfortable for about you. Time. Um, I have a very good friend, uh, Wild Bill. Mm -hmm. Wild Bill, um, I see him smoke. He is one of those guys that I, I admire because he takes his time with his cigars. He is about really slow smoking, enjoying the puffs, and I tend to smoke a little faster than I should. And so whenever I see Bill smoking, I'm always, I always appreciate that he... He's a go, go, go guy, mm -hmm. like I am. Right, but sure. when you have a cigar in his hand and he's on his patio, he really slows down. Yes. M Miguel, how do that. you know if, you, uh, if you're hot boxing a cigar? So to me, you're going to get overly bitter notes. Yep. You're going to get, um, you're the, actually you can see in the end of your cigar where the ash looks completely screwed up. It looks very flaky. It, uh, your, your, uh, what they call the, um, the uh, carbon ring on your cigar will get much larger. If you're knocking your ash off and you have a cone, that means you're smoking too fast and you're hot boxing it. So when you knock that ash off, if you see a cone, you are absolutely doing it incorrectly. 
So it's like it's like burning food. It's like burning food, absolutely. Yeah. And and you know what? You can still enjoy a steak if you burned it, but it's not going to be as good. Yeah. And hot boxing a cigar is not good. A cigar is meant to be smoked slowly, and allow those oils to all marry. And you're warming it up. I mean, you know, it's like eating a cold bowl of uh, chili, right? It's okay, but you warm it up, it's better, right? And so, so mm-hmm. you talked about uh, what's what about the inverse of hot boxing it, where it, it goes uh, starts to tunnel? Mm. What could be the causes of that? So tunneling is interesting because tunneling, there's actually a lot of issues that can lead to tunneling. One of them is just being a bad roll. These are handmade products, right? And as you know, you know these rollers are making. 250 cigars a day, sometimes more. And it being a handmade product, you're going to have some issues. Mm-hmm. And through all, of the, all the quality controls that we have today, we try to avoid that as much as we can. But you will have that once in a while. So it could be in the bunching. The, the, when you're putting the filler and the binder together, there could be a little gap. Um, also, you could have uh, a tobacco that maybe was laying and fermenting, and maybe one part of that leaf really did not get that proper fermentation, and it may be a little bit still not green, but mm-hmm. just not as well fermented as the other leaf, so it'll burn a little weird. Sure. So, in other words, those are really kind of the situations. Um, I do see people who smoke too fast, where if you have a cigar that maybe has a few little gaps in there, it'll work itself out. But if you're smoking too fast, you don't give the cigar a chance to even itself out. All right, and then totally nerdy. If uh, At this point in your career, is it possible to identify a wrapper by how it burns, its characteristics, its flakiness, its its general characteristics. I I will tell you. Um, I know a, a a guy that works in a factory, and he's uh, almost blind, and he can tell you by touch. Interesting. For me, um, I would tell you that if you put ten different wrappers in front of me, uh, I bet you I could nail eight out of ten just by touching and looking at them. I have a question. Fire away. I hear a lot of people say a cigar tastes like this, that, or the other. I don't really kind of pinpoint a taste, if you will. So uh, think of it is so I always, uh, I love talking cigars. I could do this all day. <laughs> well, you're you're so, gonna. We got another one after this. <laughs> well, think about um, so cigars weren't really being rated like that or tasted like that in the late 80s. So in ninety, in early nineties, Cigar Aficionado came about. Marvin Schenken, who owns Cigar Aficionado, well, he owned Wine Spectator, and if you look at the ratings on Wine Spectator, it was, I'm having this Cabernet Sauvignon, and I'm getting fruit forward, I'm getting a dryness, I'm getting a, a little metallic on the end, and and then you look in ninety two when he published Cigar Aficionado, they used the same hundred point scale and the same descriptions. Sure. So we have fallen into using those descriptions, which I'm fine with. There is a sense that sometimes someone goes, man, I don't taste this or I don't taste that. And they think there's something wrong with them. I think you also have to use some of your, sometimes you got to go on a limb, right? So when you're smoking this tobacco, think of it as how do you relate it to food? So to me, Mildias has a salted caramel-like taste and aroma. So when people ask me, And people will ask me, they'll say, oh, it's a flavored cigar. I go, no, 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 I'm just telling you the descriptives. Right. And I think it's easy to pick up coffee, leather, earth, nuttiness. Um, You know, I think I said woody, uh, or, or, you know, mahogany or cedar. Mm -hmm. Those, to me, are coffee-like notes. Those are very easy, I think, for you to get. Sure. Fair enough. I do think as you deep dive, you you dive a little deeper in some, and you're getting citrus peel, or you're getting... um, um, nutmeg or you're getting some of the you know exotic fruits or whatever some of these descriptions are uh, some of those i think are just trying to be as descriptive as possible and it's very hard to say oh i actually pick up a little bit of uh, peach in the cigar sure that's tough man but i understand why people who rate cigars do it because right. and- they need that they need some way to describe to you those notes but i would def- definitely say don't feel you know like oh man i'm not picking up all these notes but the more you smoke and the more you concentrate on the cigar you're smoking, the more notes you'll be able to pick up. But I will tell you this. If you're really into getting notes and tasting notes of cigars, when you eat regular food, take note of what you're eating. We have a cigar called Le Petitier. And I'm telling you what. There was one day I was at Starbucks and I got some of those chocolate-covered espresso beans. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I popped one in my mouth. And I said, oh, my God, this is like Le Petitier. 
And so when I described that cigar, I said, have you ever had a chocolate-covered espresso bean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Le Patissier. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's really so subjective. Sure. But um, I would tell you that I have met great, legendary tobacco men who describe cigars that way, and I've met great, legendary cigar makers who go, that's all bullshit. <laughs> sure. So it's it's really so subjective. Well, and especially um, if you're having a novice smoker who would uh, possibly come into the shop and they want to try something and say they're they're off of the aromatics and they want to go to a, to a natural, uh, to a traditional tobacco. Um, it's easiest for us to start them. Typically, what we would do is in the find a nice Connecticut somewhere, yep, yep. and then we can you know go with like biscuits and gravy, something yeah. that's universal that they know it's not going to taste like. Pepper, you know, yeah, it's not yeah. going to be a big bomb of, of uh, you know, heaviness, that type of thing. So it's real important, I think, that we match that. Nuttiness is another one. There's a, quite a few cigars in there that have a little bit of an almond and that type almond, of thing. Almond, walnuts. Yeah, yep. that people can actually relate to. and Salted it, peanut. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. So something else to think about when you're smoking a cigar um, is what's interesting is all the leaves are laid the same way in a cigar. So where you lit your cigar, what right. we call the foot of the cigar, those are the tips of the leaves. The part, the, the head of the cigar, the part you're putting in your mouth, are the actual part of the leaf that's closest to the plant itself. So when we lay the tobacco, the, the filler and the binder, you're smoking those leaves from tip to end. And that's something a lot of people don't think about. But that even the leaf has different flavors, components to just a full leaf. The tip tastes different than the, than the part that's connected to the plant. So that's why the cigar, that's why they're laid in that way. Now, they will break some off and lay them in there, right? Sure. But if you're smoking a long A or a Churchill or a double Corona, sometimes you're getting almost a full leaf and you're getting an incredible experience to smoke a leaf from tip to end, um, which is really the A size that is no longer really made that, that much anymore. That was really about smoking a tip to the end. Well, we have a couple uh, 50 by 10s in there that we have enjoyed mm. that are, yeah, are yeah. Quite, uh, quite different. Uh, as you go, as you go through the whole thing. So, a question about like an A size. If you have something that is ten inches long, does that introduce certain burn characteristics that are different than a shorter cigar? You know, I think, um, and again, this is kind of opinionated stuff. I think the leaf burns better on a long cigar. Interesting. The oils warm up slower, which allows that cigar to catch that heat a little bit better. And from that tip to the end of the leaf, because the tip is a thinner part of the leaf as yep. you go back, right? So the first half of that 10-inch cigar burns a little bit quicker than the last half of that cigar. And um, now we're really getting to the weeds. <laughs> but to me, if you love cigars, if you're passionate about cigars, you should take all of this into consideration and think about it when you're picking out your cigar. Um, you know, when you're smoking a little petite Corona, right? You're not smoking a full leaf. You're smoking just a piece of the leaf. And then you're smoking an A, which is a total opposite size, and you're smoking the whole leaf. Mm -hmm. They could be the same blend, the same style, but they're going to have two completely different experiences. It's fascinating when you change the size of a cigar that's supposed to be the same blend. Mm -hmm. The characteristics, the notes that come out are varied. Yeah. They're really different. Yeah. Look, I, I think it's it's it's... That filler to binder ratio, that filler to wrapper ratio changes the experience tremendously. And that's and, and you know what? I get a lot of questions from novices that'll say, well, I looked at Cigar Aficionado and, and my favorite cigar got a 91 last year and then this year it got an 89. How can that be? It's the same cigar. Well, different size preference. Different, um, you know, obviously crops change every year, but... A lot of times it could be uh, they'll say oh they'll say they'll say oh the robusto got a 91 and then but the the churchill got a 88 and the truth is is that listen man it's the same blend same cigar but that different experience that blend may have just translated better in a different vitola if you don't mind me asking what's your what's your favorite vitola uh more of a toro guy toro guy typically yeah have you picked a favorite size yet no sir not um, yet what i typically look out at look at or pick is the lighter wrapper, mm. but I'll also just let them know I want more of a light to medium body yeah. and then direct me that way. Nice. What about you, sir? Uh, the 50, <laughs> 50 ring gauge is just about perfect. There's something about... Five inch, six inch, up. seven inch. As long as it's 50, you're happy. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Absolutely. Nice. Pretty much Churchill. Every time we see Ethan. And Churchill. It's really funny. And Ethan in the shop. 
grab a big Churchill, normally a fairly stiff stick, and then take all the wrapper completely off. Yep. Nobody knows what he's smoking. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that about Ethan. Yep. Well, let me ask you. So what's interesting is in the United States, a lot of Churchills are 7 by 50 ring gauge. Yep. The true ring gauge is 7 by 47 which I think is a classic size. The Cubans still stick to that 7 by 47 once in a while. I think uh, CLE has one that I saw that was a 7 by 48. And to me, oh, that's incredible. I love those traditional Vitolas, man. I absolutely love them. And it's uh, people don't realize that there are standards in mm. the industry. There are certain types of molds that were just made because they worked. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it, the thing about this is that Corona back in the early 1900s was the most popular size. And then someone said, let's make a gigantic version and they called it a Corona Gorda. We're gonna go from 42 <laughs> to a 46, Ooh, 46 ring gauge. You're getting crazy, man. Yeah. You're getting crazy. Now that 46 ring gauge, you're like, what does that look like a Lancero? <laughs> yep. You know what I mean? So in Cuba, they still have the what they call the gallery, gallery sizes. So um, a Leguito number one in the factory in Cuba, but when it's marketed, it's marketed as a Lancero. So there's multiple names. Now, outside of there, Nicaragua, Dominican, Honduras, um, we kind of bastardized those Vitolas and names mm -hmm. and sizes because you can get a Robusto that's a 5x56 and a Robusto that's a 5x49, right? But um, I do kind of like the cool standard size. At Crown Heads, we do a lot of Corona Gordas, and the true Corona Gorda size is 5 and 7 8 by 46 ring gauge. And um, but outside of that, it's fun to play with the different sizes, and, and you just got to know your brand. You got to mm -hmm. know what they make. Sometimes a Gordo can be a fifty-six ring gauge, and then a lot of people now sixties are called Gordos. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I remember a cigar aficionado. They created a new a whole when sixties really became the rage, and they were not leaving. They were going to stay as popular. They wind up creating a new rating size called the Gordo because there there that was not a standard size. And if, if you need to know a little bit more about the sizes and uh, the shapes uh, in the humidor, we have a couple of uh, pieces of information there, uh, charts that'll let you know. Basic sizes, now everything's not on there. We got about 20 sizes on there, and it'll go through the ring gauges for you too. So if you're interested in checking that out, it's right in the humidor on the center island. And it seems like uh, uh, Crown Heads is unique. When uh, you know, I read a box, Edmundo, I'm like, what is Edmundo? <laughs> Yeah. You guys are really traditional when it comes to the size. Yeah, so our Edmundo is taken from the Cuban Monte Cristo Edmundo size, right? Um, we John Huber, who's the head of Crown Heads, if you follow our social media, that's John you see on their posting. Um, John is a true student of the game. John loves tradition, although maybe our, our names of our cigars or the bands may be a little bit unique and, yeah. and, and more modern. Our blends... Our cigars, our Vitolas, tend to be based off traditional sizes. And that Edmundo size is a Cuban size. Um, and now there's also a petite Edmundo out in the industry. Um, and so I, there's a bit of me. I'm a historian in this industry. Um, you know, I, I'm not a guy who chews my own horn, but I believe that the years and years I've spent reading books and reading about tobacco, everything I can get my hands on, I think to understand the future of our industry, you have to understand the past, where we came from, and respect the tradition. And I think that's what John has been excellent at, yeah. mixing tradition and uniqueness. So this for us is a gigantic cigar. 56 is huge for crown heads. <laughs> this is the biggest cigar we make, right, as far as ring gauge goes. Sure. Um, but it's a new size for us, and I think it appeals to a different smoker because a lot of our guys are smoking the Corona Gordas or mm -hmm. our 50 ring gauges and 52 ring gauges. So... Being a 56 is unique. You're, and not, you're not ready to step up with Christian yet and start doing 70s and 80s? No, listen, listen. Tom Lazuka, my good friend at Asylum. <laughs> love Tom. I love Christian. Those are two guys I respect so much in this industry. They have nailed the 660, 770, 880. Um, they, they own that market. Uh, them and Agronosa do a great job at the big ring gauges. So we don't play in that world. I, I, I honestly believe that... Um, there's, you know, I, I always kind of point out to like, if you go down the soda aisle, soda. it's hard to believe that there's that many brands yes. and they're all selling. Mm -hmm. And I think cigars are a lot like that, right? Um, there's brands that don't make a cola. They make flavored cola. They do this or do that. Everyone kind of specializes. And I think all of us add something to the industry. Correct. And, and I think Asylum made big ring gauges not only cool, they weren't the first to do it, sure, but they made it available in so many different vitolas and blends and sizes, and or you know, uh, they've done a great job at it. 
So now that uh, you're about, it uh, looks like about a third of the way through that, Paul, what are you, uh, what, what's it like to you? Just in, in, your, in your own language, how would you describe that first third? It's what I've been trying to figure out, but I'd put it as dry. Mm-hmm. Dry yeah, fruit. I'll go to a medium coffee taste, if you will. All right, yeah. So I would tell you that on that first um, third, you're going to get some dry fruit. So you're sort of in that ballpark right there. I think that you get a very latte coffee, meaning it's very muted. Mm -hmm. Like you have an espresso, but you put milk in it and, and you still get those coffee notes, but they're not as pronounced in some in some of our blends. So I would tell you you're kind of around that right, right ballpark. I think what's going to happen now is it's going to sweeten up on you a little bit. Now these oils are all warmed up. You're still going to you're going to start getting some of that burnt caramel, uh, kind of caramello kind of uh, kind of flavor notes on your palate. And through this cigar, after you 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 let the smoke out for a little while, you should be able to taste a little bit of saltiness on your palate. Okay. And why is there a technical reason on? Um, it, you know, if you, if you divide a cigar into thirds, why would it be different other than even just the, the combustion, the, the heat? Because the wrapper itself is, is flavored in, ter- in thirds. So that tip, the middle, and the end, and that's where that came from. When you say flavored <clears throat> in thirds, mm-hmm. just expand on that a little bit. So um, when the cigar starts off, um, you know, every good show has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? And that's kind of how a cigar is. And so traditionally, the tip of the leaves... Um, are going to taste different than the end, right? So your first third are going to have a very different, dif- depending on the, the, the wrapper and the seed strain. But after you get past that first third of the leaf, then you start getting into the meatier part of the leaf. And then it starts changing on you a little bit. Heavier leaves, thicker leaves, and then towards the end, you're getting the heaviest and thickest of those leaves and very pronounced flavors opposed to the tip, which is our thinner leaves. And can a blender actually, um, you know, play with the first, yes. third, middle, and then the end? Absolutely. When you're, when you're teaching your, your, your rolling team how to make a particular blend together, right, you're giving them all the components and you're showing them, sometimes they'll say, hey, listen, when you rip off that end, bring it all the way to the back because I want some of those thin leaves. But they're still laying them the same way, right? But they're just putting them in different positions. So yes, people do do that. Not talked about much, right? But that's how you can play with it a little bit. It was fascinating when I went to Hoy de Nicaragua. They, um, the, the, the rollers did not know which cigar yeah. they were making. Yeah. And in a sense, my, my understanding is that they didn't want to reveal the recipe to everybody. Partly it's the recipe and partly what you're doing essentially to that roller is you're making him blind. You don't know if you're rolling a $30 cigar or an $8 cigar, but you have to put the same quality of work into all of them. So many times, they have no idea. The person that does know are the supervisors, the guys that are walking up and down, spot checking, and when they bring it to the uh, you know to the to the color color um, grading and all that, that's when you know what what cigar. And sometimes you can't even tell. Now I worked at CAO for many years, and I remember going down to the factory and they were rolling Italia and Brasilia at the same time. Mm-hmm. The leaf is very wet while you're rolling. They both looked like jet black Maduros. (laughs) But after they sit on the rolling bench for about a half an hour, the Brasilia blend stayed dark and the Italia lightened up to a light Colorado. And so even sometimes looking at it, you really don't even know. You leave, you, you know, you leave it up to the, to the people that are in charge knowing what tobacco they're giving them uh, to roll. But um, uh, yeah, so um, you want your rollers to believe that they need the quality of a $5 cigar or $30 cigar you're rolling and you typically do not disclose to them. Now, when you do disclose to them, usually it's a special cigar, right? Um, Opus X, they have an Opus X rolling room. Those rollers know they're rolling Opus. We have a cigar called La Varetta. La Varetta is our top of the choice, four to three, three to four year old aged tobaccos. Those rollers know ahead of time that they're rolling that cigar. Sure. Because not only are we allowing them to roll that cigar, we've actually tapered back how many cigars they're rolling a day to take their time on those cigars. And I'm assuming just like any other business, those rollers have either the most experience or have shown commitment and or the consistent quality in their in their final yeah. product. Yeah, sometimes when people um, see these super master rollers, they're expecting to see like uh, 80-year-old women, and that's not always the case. Mm. You know, sometimes it's a 60-year-old woman who's been doing it her whole life, and sometimes there's a 25-year-old guy or girl, I'm just saying women, but um, that are just, they've picked it up so well. They've got the dexterity. 
they just got it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like, um, you know, not everyone can hit a baseball, right? right? And sometimes you you find a roller who just naturally has what it takes to do a great role, and they get they get to move up. And usually they're being paid a little bit more, um, and um, you sometimes tap into their greatness by having them roll special, limited edition. Um, I, I can't speak for Christian, but I know he had that first 20-year uh, cigar. I would imagine that maybe he hand selected some of his best rollers, and also too, it's a sign of respect too. Sure, any of the rollers could roll that cigar, right? Or you wouldn't have them rolling. But sometimes it's also going, "Hey, I'm picking you to roll this special cigar for me." Mm-hmm. And it's fascinating when we did our own blends down in Nicaragua. They sent them home with you, and they say, "Man, uh, have one at three months, have another one at six, have another one at nine, and yeah. it's a completely different animal." So I call that the, 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 the chili theory, right? So I tell people, I go, you make a pot of chili tonight for dinner. I'm going to enjoy it. Sure. You sit that in your refrigerator for five days. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Right. It's flavor and stereo. Yes. Right? And it just gets better every day, every day. That's the same thing with tobacco, right? So tobacco leaves. You have your, 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 your visos, your secos, your lajeros. These are all different uh, primings, if you will. And they all have different oil content and... If you just lit up a wrapper or a leaf, it would taste great. You put two leaves together, they taste good. Mm -hmm. But if you allow those two leaves to lay next to each other and let their oils marry, all of a sudden you have this this harmonious flavor. And that's what you get with aging your cigar, allowing it to sit and allowing the oils from the wrapper to marry with the binder and those oils to get into the filler. And when you do that you have something very special. So if you pick up a cigar off the rolling table, you go, oh, I like that. It's probably going to taste a hell of a lot better in three to six months. And uh, just like a, <laughs> uh, um, uh, a vertical tasting in the wine world. I know you're a wine guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would be very interesting to take a cigar and do that. Take a, take a, like a 16, a 17, and an 18, a, a one of your favorite cabs, yep. and then a, a one and a two and a three-year-old cigar. I know there's a couple of different podcasters I've talked to, and they do what they call an aging experiment. Mm-hmm. And they'll get a box and they'll smoke one on camera and they'll shoot another video a year later out of that same box and get their reactions. And then they kind of compare what it was a year ago to then. It's a really, it's a long game. Sure, yeah. (laughs) But I do think that cigar smokers, especially novices or people just getting into the the club, if you will, of cigars, it's very interesting for them to know. Because so many of them go, okay, I just walk in a humidor, pick up a cigar and I light it. And that's great. But when you really get into it and you start aging a cigar or you, there's nothing better than handing someone a cigar with age on it. Because I always say this, you can age, you can fake a Maduro in mm-hmm. this in this industry by cooking the wrapper. You can fake sweetness by adding sugar, artificial sugar to the, to the cigar. You can fake age, or, or I'm sorry, you can fake uh, strength by putting under fermented tobacco, but you can't fake age. Age has a very distinct flavor um, think of it as like a, like a, like a 30 day dry aged steak. It just, it has a unique aroma and flavor to it. Um, and so a lot of people, I get, yesterday I was in your guys' humidor and a person, a lady said, oh man, how, how long can these cigars be in here for? And I said, listen, Christie's auction house in London, they're, they're auctioning cigars from the forties, the thirties, um, the fifties, the sixties, you mm-hmm. know, pre-embargo stuff. And I don't know if you saw this or not, but the Newman family down in, uh, down in um, uh, Tampa at their, their offices there, they have a museum. And they just purchased the oldest cigars um, known to man. Did you see this? 1860-something, I believe. Holy cow. 1860-something. Wow. Hmm. They were at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> there was, a, uh, there was a, 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 a ship that in the late 1800s, they, they were leaving, middle 1800s, they were leaving Panama, they went to stop in Havana, and they were on their way to somewhere in the Carolinas, and the, and the ship sank. And just recently, they went down there and started pulling up a lot of the stuff, and there was a bag from one of the, the passengers. And this bag, almost completely sealed, not penetrated by water. Interesting. They pulled it up, and in there, he had 25 or 26 uh, Havana cigars, Perfectos. And uh, the Newman family bought them and put them on display. Nice. Yeah. I mean, definitely what I've heard is that if you have a pre-embargo cigar or whatever it is, that e- even under really good conditions, um, there, there's a sense where after 40 years or something like that, really you have um, 
paper left. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like anything else. A bottle of wine doesn't mean it's going to always get better. I mean, you could get worse with age, right? Yeah. And tobacco's the same way. I think a safe part is 99% of cigar smokers are never going to smoke a cigar that's 40, yes. 30 years old. Yep. Um, most guys that are aging cigars are a year to five years. And if you're going to start with a very mild cigar, they typically do not age very well. But a full-bodied, robust, heavy, thick tobacco with age tends to age very well. But like anything, it can age out. It can get to a point. I know some hardcore collectors that um, a couple years ago, they were saying, oh, man, if you got Davidoff Dom Perignons, you know, they were made, they were rolling 88 in Cuba for Davidoff before Davidoff went to the Dominican. And they said, man, if you got those, you better start smoking those because those are starting to lose its character. And, you know, I don't play in that world, but I know a lot of guys that do. And they'll tell you, there's, there's, there are blends that just age out. And sure. it is not going to get better. And if you could take a cigar tour, uh, one of the things that was really memorable is you have all of the raw ingredients, the components, the tobacco leaves, burning them. They all have a unique yeah. um, uh, way they burn, aroma, and, and there's something really powerful about um, when you smell something and can identify it. It sticks in your memory, and then you'll come back, and, and uh, uh, they'll light up that cigar, and, and you can almost, in your brain, start to take apart the different leaves that are in there and the characteristics and you'd add something special to uh, your appreciation. So next year, um, Tim Osgener from Osgener Family Cigars, who's uh, with Crown Heads, um, Tim is going to do a um, uh, behind a blend kind of thing where we're going to bring components of his cigars that people will be able to smoke and taste the different components and then you'll be able to taste the final cigar. And maybe not every component, but we're going to give you the distinct components of each cigar and I think that just helps a person appreciate the yeah. cigar even more to understand those different components. I mean, I, I tell people, have you ever tasted fish sauce mm -hmm. by itself? It's horrible. Yep. But then you put it in something. Talking tartar sauce? No, 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 no. <laughs> what the hell is no. fish sauce? Fish sauce is uh, used in a lot of Asian cooking. Oh. And if you smell it, I mean, it's horrible. It smells horrible. But there's certain stews and soups and pho and things like that that they put it in. And it's like very umami. And by itself, you go, man, that's horrible. But then you put it in and you go, oh, man, this is mm -hmm. incredible. So there's tobacco like that. There's tobacco you would smoke by itself and go, man, this is beautiful. And then there's tobacco you go, I don't get it. But when you put it in another blend, it complements the other tobaccos. And you go, oh, I get it. I get it. So Tim Osgener always talks about Ometepe. Ometepe was a tobacco he didn't use at CAO. It's kind of come into vogue recently. Um, and he goes, he's tasted it by itself. He goes, nah, I'm not really a fan of Ometepe. But when he worked it into one of his blends, he goes, that's the missing component. But by itself, he didn't like that leaf. But mm. in, the, in the blend, sure. it helped work. It popped it off a little bit. All right, we're halfway now, Paul. What are, what are we thinking? First of all, let me ask you this question. As a novice smoker, with this, um, you said you normally do light to medium light. Are you feeling any effects from the cigar? Any, any wooziness, any lightheadedness? Are you, are you holding your own? I'm holding my own just because if you're going to talk about wooziness, I'm going to have to compare that to a cigar that was given to me approximately 17 or 18 years ago on an empty stomach. Ooh. And uh, rough that, day. That, rough day. That was a rough drive home. <laughs> <laughs> I called my brother and I'm like, what did you give me? And he started laughing and I'm, he's like, you feeling sick? I'm like, I'm trying to make it home. Yeah. It's, again, 20 minutes. But I do have a question about the, the leaves. Mm -hmm. Some articles that I've read or research I've done, if they have oils in it, why do they hang them? Hmm. The tobacco leaf itself? Yes, sir. So in a, in a curing barn, after the leaves are taken from the uh, plant itself, they're hand sewn and hung up in curing barns. And what you're essentially doing at that point, the reason they're hanging them is, is obviously gravity helps. Um, and with the aging pro or the, 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 the natural time they spend in the curing barn, they're trying to get all the chlorophyll out of the leaves. And so the chlorophyll, you'll notice on a plant, it starts changing color to that yellow to beige to brown in the vein, and it kind of goes, starts going out and pushing out all that. So I don't know the exact reason why it's hung that way, but I would imagine it has to do with just how it's always been done and why it's done that way. But that's the only time it gets hung like that, because once it gets taken down and it gets put in, um, in pilons and fermented, they're laid down flat on their sides. So that then would that make the most flavor of that leaf in the middle? 
So that is really an opinion. Some people really like the first half of a cigar. I meet people that go, man, my favorite part of the cigar is that first inch. Other people go, man, you know, some guys have those little nubbers and they love that end of that cigar and they love that boldness and that stronger, more potency. And obviously the cigar doesn't have a filter, but the end of that cigar acts as a natural filter, right? So it's catching a little bit of tar and a little bit of nicotine. We're all trying to, obviously through the fermentation period, we're trying to get rid of a uh, um, uh, pneumonia and things like that. And so, but some people like that intensity. So the truth is, is it's really about preference when it comes to that. I think a cigar hits midway that's my favorite part of the cigar, me personally. Sure. Because I think at that point, the oils are so warm that you're tasting the true essence of what that cigar maker wanted you to smoke. And we have someone in the room here who I have noticed over the last year very rarely smokes the last third. Wild Bill. Now, I have to agree. I, I tend to smoke to the band. Mm-hmm. And uh, now look, everyone's different. Sure. But I tend to smoke to the band, and then I light another cigar. I'm not a nubber. Mm-hmm. Are you a nubber? I, it, it just depends if I'm really enjoying it. But then the problem becomes, like you were saying earlier, once I get closer to the end, it gets hotter. Everything changes, yep. and in the what I was really enjoying for the first like four inches uh, isn't there anymore. Yep, yep, yep. I would agree. I don't know. I like. I like to. I guess the question is how how short is a nub? I'll go down to... That's a nub. That's a nub. You know, uh, it's funny. People have all these cool tools they've invented for cigars. Essentially, it's a roach clip, right? Sure. And um, and there are guys that will put that little roach clip and smoke it to there's almost nothing left. And then there's guys who carry a pipe with them, and they'll put that end of that cigar in a pipe to get all of it, right? And to me, to each his own, you have to enjoy the cigar the way you enjoy it. I smoke a lot. And I, I, I tend to get to the band and then I'm done. I want to relight and have that experience again. Um, but if you enjoy taking it down to the nub, to me, what you're saying is that cigar maker did a great job because if you can smoke it all the way to the nub, he's done a wonderful job at, at making a cigar, one, you enjoy, and two, hanging off on some of that bitterness or that, 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 that roughness that can come at the very end of a cigar. Well, I think we have uh, graduated now Novice to tapas has become more like a master's class. That's what happens when we get uh, Miguel Chaudel talking about cigars. Ethan, do you have anything else to add before we uh, wrap this part up? No. Uh, fascinating, man. Thank you, Miguel, for information. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Uh, yeah. and, and, and you guys are awesome. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, I've been able to smoke with this guy a little bit, and that's been a joy. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure meeting you, sir. So, Paul, we'll put, you on the, we'll put you on the spot right now. You've been in town for a couple of days. I'm assuming you're having a few cigars. Never mind that Miguel's sitting next to you. Do you have a favorite that you've had over the last couple of days? Something you really enjoyed? To be honest with you, I probably smoked. This will be the third one today, third different one on top of that. I'll, I'll say this. Your team at Deadwood gave you a, a humidor. I'd say my favorite was this Andy's Mint one, man. Ah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's a popular one. That would be the uh, Caffeina, probably Dark Roast Ice. Uh, very popular. Um, I saw that in your humidor, man. A yep. lot of people were picking that up. Yep, little aromatic cigar. A lot of people, especially if they have it in the morning with their coffee or last thing of the night. So... That's that's uh, that's good. Everybody's got their own taste. That's why we've got hundreds and hundreds of sticks in there. That's what makes a great humidor. You guys have a little bit of everything. Thank you very much, Miguel Chaudel from Crowned Heads. Paul Rechtenwald visiting and uh, taking the uh, cigar smoking experience. I am Eye Candy Randy. Thanks for watching and listening. Make sure you click like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. More podcasts coming up. Check out everything at deadwoodtobacco.com and all the social medias at Deadwood Tobacco. Thanks very much, Ethan.